We live in a fast-moving world. All around us, the most extraordinary processes. With access to some of the most fascinating factories, I take you behind the scenes to reveal their production secrets. From craft workshops to international industries. Join me, Francesca Chiarando, as we explore the world's ultimate processes. Today we are visiting two quite different places. First, a workshop making individually crafted musical instruments. And second, we go to Marshall Amplification, one of the most famous rock and roll factories in the world. And we're going to bring these two places together. In this program, we go on a musical journey as we explore what it takes to make one of these an electric guitar. For decades, they shaped the history of rock and pop. They not only sound great, they look good as well. The basic design hasn't changed that much, but to make an electric guitar takes real skill and experience. This is the workshop at Crimson Guitars, where they specialize in custom-built models. So we set the team here a challenge, to build a guitar in just three days. It's only three days because that's when this man is booked to put the guitar through its paces. Chris George, voted Young Guitarist of the Year when he was just 16, is Marshall Amplification's main demonstrator. Or you can really give it some. <laughs> The extra twist to the tale is Chris is a left-handed player. That really adds to the challenge because the vast majority of guitars are right-handed. Marshall has been at the very heart of the rock and roll story for decades, making amps and speakers for some of the biggest bands in the world. So to find out just how good a guitar is going to sound, playing it through a Marshall would be an obvious choice. And I'm meeting the man who is taking up the three-day challenge. Ben Crow is the boss at Crimson Guitars. He certainly has the experience. Ben and his team have been making hand-built guitars since 2005. From the beginning, I was passionate about guitars. And then rock and roll, and uh, it, it's a different world. I got the bug, and, uh, and that was that, really. Usually, it can take Ben an entire month to build just one guitar. Three days will require the whole Crimson team working together. One of the first things a guitar maker has to decide is what wood to use. It not only determines how the instrument will sound, but how it looks. And here at Crimson, they love natural finishes. Preparing the timber correctly is crucial. It's not just a matter of taking a saw to a tree. Far from it. The wood needed to make a guitar has to be carefully prepared and matured. Over the years, Ben has built up an impressive stock of many different types of timber. In guitar building, we use a huge variety of timbers. And I mean, this is just one, one shelf, my personal favorite shelf. This here is quilted or pommel sapili. And uh, I'm, gonna make, I'm gonna make a neck out of this to match a plank from the same, same tree, basically. And that's going to be the body. This is a private stock instrument that uh, I might end up having to keep for myself. Um, through to, well, for example, uh, this is camphor. So, so this smells of camphor, it's a camphor tree incredibly rare to find it uh, figured like this. And uh, 
we took six months sourcing some of this for a client and uh, in the process ended up with quite a few pieces in stock. So we've probably got a bigger stock of that than, than many. Different woods create different sounds. For electric guitar bodies, you need a wood with rich tones like alder or ash. For the fretboard, ebony or rosewood. Now check out this quilted bird's eye maple. It's absolutely beautiful. But to get a real idea of what it's going to look like under finish, just squirt it with water or a bit of alcohol. And that, that shows you what it's going to look like. And it's just beautiful. It looks like galaxies. We will even use stair treads or how about how about coffee tables? This, this used to be a coffee table. It's made out of grade A mahogany. It's perfectly seasoned, perfectly dry. And these days, grade A mahogany is on the CITES list of protected species. We can't cut it down because it's endangered now. If it's from old furniture or an old piano or something of the like, yeah, it's fair game as long as you can prove provenance. And this is excellent wood for guitar building. Tonally, it's amazing. As an expert in timber, Ben knows what wood makes a good guitar. He also knows where to get it, and he has some unusual sources. I get a, a lot of my timber from a local sawyer. They're always looking for special stuff for me, flame sycamore or whatever. He was offered a bunch of trees that had been in a lake. The lake was made 300 years ago, and uh, a lot of trees were felled in the process and ended up in the bottom. They've just dredged it, pulled up some amazing old burl oak trees, sycamore, walnut, and uh, it's been sitting in the bottom of this silty mess for 300 years, basically taking on character. You would think that it would rot away, but uh, in the silt at the bottom of the lake, it becomes an anaerobic environment with no air, and without air, you can't have the bacteria that eats the wood. These are once-in-a-lifetime locks, and uh, we're really looking forward to making a series of guitars based on this. Of course, the Crimson team is not just about making guitars. Many of them are keen players. The first stage is preparing your timber, and uh, we will do that preferably years in advance. We will thickness the wood down to roughly the correct dimension and then stick it in the timber store and sit on it for years. Once we've had the timber drying for that number of years, uh, to take it and actually turn it into a guitar, talking realistically, a custom guitar, you can spend any time up to two or three months working on it. To make our guitar, we are using four kinds of wood. First, babinga, a strong hard wood for the neck. Cherry, great resonance for the body. Good looking flamed sycamore for the top. And rosewood for the fretboard. Now, our guitar just needs building. Most things at Crimson are made by hand but they do have a machine room where they can do some of the more basic, labor-intensive jobs much faster. These are CNC machines, computer numerically controlled, and they operate on their own. One of the youngest apprentices at Crimson, Tanya Tate, sets the machine up. It's going to help create the body for our guitar. a power router, which is basically an automated chisel. This means a process that once took hours is now done in just minutes. It's fast work and quickly the shape of the guitar begins to emerge. They also have another, much smaller CNC machine. This is used for more delicate work. It's creating the ornate Celtic cross style inlay for the fretboard. The pattern is already programmed into the computer and tells the machine exactly what to cut. 
It will give our guitar real style. One day down and the pieces of our guitar are coming together. You can see the body's not entirely solid. It has what guitar makers call chambers. This gives it a more acoustic feel and makes it slightly lighter. Next, the fascia. You can clearly see the central holes where the electric pickups will go. They give the instrument its voice once they're plugged into an amplifier and speakers. Which is why we are also visiting Marshall, a company with a reputation for making some of the most famous amps and speakers in the world. Marshall is a global brand, a logo famous on stages and recording studios around the world. And there's a very good reason for that. Marshall Amplification is one of the legendary names in rock and roll. Most of the guitar heroes of the last 50 years have played their instruments through a Marshall. The story of these amps goes back to the early 1960s. It was a humble beginning. The very first models were assembled in the back of a drum shop in West London. Now, they have a thriving factory, producing over 300 amps a week. The man who owned the drum shop was Jim Marshall. Musicians who had become some of rock's biggest stars persuaded Jim to build amplifiers and speakers that were better and cheaper than the Americans. Pete Townsend, guitarist with The Who, was one of them. Pete Townsend used to come into the store and ask Jim for, a, for an amplifier because he believed what he could get wasn't loud enough. So he said to Jim, he said, I need a louder amp. So Jim went away as he did, listened to what the artists want and manufactured him a, a louder amplifier. <laughs> And Pete, Pete Townsend said that, actually, the presence on stage is not quite what I want. He said, I want an 8 by 12 cabinet. Jim's comment to Pete Townsend was, that's going to be very heavy. Pete Townsend said, not my problem, that's why I have roadies. So anyway, after he took it away and came back, he said, you're right, it's too heavy. So what happened then was they cut it into half. This then became what is known as today as the stack. So it's a 1960B with a 1960A on top with a 100 watt head. And that's synonymous with rock and roll, synonymous with Pete Townsend, synonymous with Marshall. Other big names included Eric Clapton and Jack Bruce from the first supergroup, Cream. We had um, a wonderful setup. I, mean, I heard all of Cream's music before they went on the road. And Jack and Eric would come in, they'd take two acoustic guitars off the wall, sit on the amplifiers, and they would start rehearsing and playing there. They were so committed to each other. They couldn't, you know, sit down for five minutes without performing. And this was great, I heard everything. Terry, a saxophone player, has been a musician since he was 16. He was a lucky teenager. Some of the giants of rock and roll turned up at his father's shop wanting equipment, including Jimi Hendrix. With Jimi, his way of setting up the amplifiers was just for him. He wanted to get the most from the amplifier. When an amplifier is running full on, you have this um, enharmonic distortion caused through the valves and also the sustain, so he could get feedback very quickly and hold on to it. But the way he set up, was purely to run his hand along all the control knobs to be full on. And then the back, back down the guitar, and that was his controlling part, was his guitar. He never tweaked his amplifiers on stage, and they were full on. Playing really loud affected many musicians. Several suffered significant hearing loss. Pete Townsend was among them. So was drummer Phil Collins. And Neil Young has suffered from tinnitus 
for years. But how do electric guitars and amplifiers actually work? How do they create sound? First of all, the guitar's electromagnetic pickups literally pick up the vibrations of the strings. These are converted into electromagnetic sound signals and are then sent to an amplifier. These signals are still quite weak, so, as the name suggests, the amplifier boosts the original signal from the pickups. Typically, this happens in two stages. First, the signal goes through a preamp. This makes the signal strong enough to drive the power amp. The power amp produces a stronger current signal, which in turn drives the loudspeakers, which convert the electrical signal into the sounds we know and love. One of Crimson's most experienced guitar makers is Tom March, who used to make modern furniture. Now he's turned his talents to musical instruments. When it comes to building a guitar, for Tom, there's only one place to begin. Well, I'd usually start with the neck because it's, I think it's probably the most important part of it, and it's where all the, it's where the, the difficult bit is, really. Most of the work's in the neck. You've got your shaping and you've got your frets, which is very important. If those are in the wrong place, then you've got a permanently out tuned guitar. So, yeah, it's where all the action is, really. There's a lot more to building a guitar than meets the eye. Some parts you will never see. Something called a truss rod, a steel rod used to stop the neck bowing because of the pressure from the strings, goes into a thin groove at the back of the fretboard. Basically, the truss rod is the uh, it's a metal bar which basically counteracts the tension of the strings. The strings are going to pull the neck up. You do want a slight camber in there anyway, but the truss rod allows you to pull it back and adjust it and get that relief just right. Once the machine room at Crimson has done its job and created the basic shape of the guitar body, it's time once again to pick up the tools. Most processes here are done by hand, and this is why. Craftsmanship is at the centre of what happens here at Crimson Guitars. To build this sense of craft and expertise, they employ apprentices. These are young people who come in to learn every aspect of guitar making. The skills they need to succeed can take years to develop. Two of those apprentices are about to start work on our guitar. The neck has been fretted, but needs to be carved. The body has been assembled and glued, but still has a way to go. OK, we're going to get this done in, in fairly short order. I want to get this uh, ready for the demo. Um, Daniel, fret work. Yep. Snip the ends off with the fret cutters and get them at the correct angle. This is going to be the first thing that's actually finished on the whole guitar. Uh, essentially, you're preparing this so that I can uh, take it away and carve it okay. uh, in half an hour or so. Be very careful. These fret ends are nastily sharp. sharp. OK. Um, and Tanya, I've done the rough carving, and you need to take it to the sanding station, okay. use the murka. You can see we've got hard lines. Yes. Yeah. I want to just soften those off. But we need to keep that flat where the pickups are. Use your hands. Your finger is so sensitive, you can feel more than see the shape when you're doing this. Yeah. Um, start with 180 grit sandpaper. Mm -hmm. And once you've, hit, once you've hit the whole thing of 180, come give me a shark and we'll, we'll have a feel. Okay. This one here, may I have the neck? Yep. This whole area. Mm -hmm. Mustn't forget that the neck's going to be glued onto that. Right. So I just draw. If you change the shape inside of those lines, 
we're going to have some trouble. There is no time to lose. The apprentices get straight to work. Here is the neck that we're working on. Now, these frets have been sorted out by Daniel. The fret ends have been taken off and uh, are nice and clean and safe. And uh, it's my job now. It's my job to carve it. With the pressure on to get the job done in time, Ben steps in to shape the neck, a key part of the process. For speed, he uses an angle grinder with a rather clever blade. It has large holes, so when it spins at high speed, he can see exactly where he's working. And this has to be precise. Ben is what is known in the trade as a luthier, someone who makes and repairs stringed instruments. The word comes originally from the French. It means lute maker. The definition of a, a luthier has morphed from literally lute maker to guitar maker, and it denotes quality. You can work in a factory and be part of the process of making a guitar. Unless you can make an entire instrument on your own, you can't call yourself a luthier. It, it, it literally is fine stringed instrument maker, shall we say, because um, violin makers and the like are also classed as luthiers. A reasonable handmade guitar could set you back between 250 to 3,000 euros. But the more famous master luthiers can charge a great deal more. Luthiers who have built up a good reputation can ask well over 30,000 euros for a basic instrument. Add in all the extras, like a hand-carved sound hole, and it could be another 6,000 euros. What links both Marshall and Crimson in a very direct way are the materials they use. Wood is the basis of a guitar, and at Marshall, one of the first jobs in building an amp is to make a strong wood cabinet. They use plywood because they need to be tough. They have to survive life on the road. This is where we have a, a resin mixture of hardener powder and resin mixed together. We take the top spot and size, apply that within the finger joints, push the cabinet together by hand, and then place it inside the press. The press will then have four clamps pressing the cabinet together and squaring the cabinet up and baking the cabinet to a hard finish. Making a marshal requires considerable handiwork. With the carcass of the cabinet complete, it's time to assemble the internal housing for the speakers and amp. Now it's really beginning to take shape. While the cabinets are being built, work also begins on assembling the circuit boards. These are the electrical components which give every amp its unique sound. This is at the heart of the Marshall process. The electronics are complicated and can take time, so part of the process is automated. There are several different models of amps, so the machine is programmed for each one. Marshall's auto insertion machine makes short work of creating the basic elements of the circuit board. It can process up to 130 boards an hour. But some of this work has to be done by hand. The parts are an awkward shape. The job requires considerable patience and experience. It's the same in the cabinet department. Here, there is also a handcrafted finish. Once the profiling's been done on the front of the unit, 
All our beading slots have to be finished off by hand with an angle grinder. This is to allow the beading to fit in there nicely and to follow the radius of the unit on the front of the unit. Each cabinet is hand sanded. It's checked over for any defects in wood which will be repaired and re-sanded down before it will go on to its final stage. Finally, each cabinet is sprayed Marshall's signature black, one of the main colours of rock and roll. It's not just guitars that are made at Crimson. They also handcraft the tools needed to make guitars. This is a really specialist area. Essentially, a lot of the business is teaching people how to make instruments, and I want to train the people who are coming up after yeah. us. And uh, part of that is, is making various, various tools. It's a specialist trade. Mm -hmm. So a standard file wouldn't cut it. It has to be in a handle. It has to be adjustable to be perfectly flat. And uh, there are only a few companies in the world that do it. And we do it better than most of them. Charlie, one of the apprentices at Crimson, makes a special file. Using an angle grinder, he shears off surplus metal before it's attached to a wooden stock. Some of the tools might look simple, but they have taken years to perfect. What we want is when we hit the frets, we want the hammer to stop dead. Most hammers will rebound. They bounce, don't they? It's called a dead blow hammer. The metal head is hollow and contains loose lead shot. So when it strikes, the lead slams down and keeps the hammer head still. It means the hammer head does not bounce. And that keeps the top of what is being hit completely flat. Most hammers bounce up and we wanted to put lead shot down the center of the shaft. It took me two years to figure out how to, and it seems simple in hindsight, but we now wrap the handle around the shaft and there's a hole down the middle with lead shot in it. It's called a dead blow hammer, basically. When, when you pull backwards, the lead is up here, and as you hit, it goes down and it stops, and it stops the rebounding. So this is designed specifically for a specific job, and, and does that particular job perfectly. Quality is important at Marshall. So often, they make the amps from scratch using raw materials. Sheets of metal are shaped into the amp chassis to give them strength. First, holes are stamped out to allow for wiring. A power-operated hydraulic press bends the sheets into shape. A lot of that work begins here, in the engineering department. This is where they produce the metal boxes, which will house all the delicate electronics. They begin as simple sheet metal. Holes are punched out to create the correct shape for the wiring. A few well-practiced shakes and the metal blanks fall out. The holes for the tone and volume controls are clearly visible. Using a special power-operated hydraulic press, the box, or chassis, is carefully bent into shape. Here is where Marshall is extremely thorough. For added strength and integrity, the corners of the metal boxes are welded, and this requires patience and skill. The workshop at Crimson is packed with many different kinds of tools, from power routers to angle grinders to basic hand chisels. One very special tool they use here is this, a simple scraper. There's almost nothing to it. It has one tiny but very effective cutting edge, and it flexes so it can change shape. For creating the body of a guitar, it's ideal. For Ben Crow, a craftsman at heart, it's one of his favourites. I'm doing this the old world, old fashioned way, using hand scrapers and the like. And it might seem slightly slower, but in the end, I'm avoiding changing through four or five different grits of sandpaper on the machine. I'm going right to almost the final finish, 
with one process. And uh, we will have this guitar under finish very, very soon. Ben insists See, just, I have a go. We're, we're yeah. going at it. Okay. So just uh, at that sort of angle, just, just push. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Kind of like screen printing. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Except you've got a little tooth, a burr, where the steel is turned over. And that makes shavings and gives you a better finish than sandpaper. Exactly. They're, um... It's sort of a dark art. It's an old, <laughs> an old tool that isn't used very often. Why because not? they're quite difficult to sharpen. To keep it sharp, Ben uses a heavy, smooth steel to create a tiny razor blade edge. This is a lovely bit of wood. It looks beautiful. This has been sanded with a power tool to about 180 grit. Now, taking that away with a blade, and I'm not quite finished, but you can immediately see that that's starting to shine and it's just coming out and uh, it makes it makes all the difference over onto the headstock it's a different wood and you can still see this is really shiny and a good finish from the scraper and this dull dull looking bit is uh, from the sandpaper it just comes to life under the blade Determined to get the guitar completed, Ben works on into the night. At the heart of a Marshall amp are the electrics. Getting them right is essential. Once all the components are in place, they're soldered together. It then goes through what's called a flow solder machine. Now, obviously, we could do it all by hand, but to solder a circuit board such as the JVM, there's 500 components. You'd be looking at probably close to 2,000 solder joints. That couldn't be done by hand and be accurate. So it goes through a flow solder machine. Basically what this is, it sprays you underneath with flux. It then warms the circuit board up to the right temperature. And then there's a bath of about nine liters of solder, which is liquid, which is sitting about 260 degrees centigrade. You have a pump in there and it pumps it over a framework which gives you a wave of solder, which solders the underneath of the circuit board all at the same time. To solder a circuit board, which would take maybe 25 minutes by hand, it takes about 12 seconds. And what you get is a perfect solder joint. Once it comes off there, it's then visually inspected by, an, by a, um, a person. If they're happy with that, it then goes through another computer which physically tests the circuit board. There's a very good reason why guitarists love Marshall amps. Because of the way they are wired and because they use valves, they go into overdrive sooner. This boosts the treble and gives that slightly dirty, distinctly Marshall sound. So what comes next is possibly the secret ingredient of the whole process. It's the valves that help give Marshall their unique sound. Warm, but with just enough harmonic distortion. A quality Marshall perfected back in the 1960s, early in the company's history. It was the first amplifier that deliberately distorted. Everything else up to then, or most of them up to then, tried to stop the distortion. Uh, we went against the grain and made the amplifier designed to distort. This gave the advantage to the guitarist, allowing them to have controlled feedback. It's this distortion which creates the character of the Marshall sound. At Crimson, the deadline is looming. Will they get the guitar completed on time? The neck and the body still need gluing together. First, 
Ben makes sure it's going to be a perfect fit. OK, I'm happy with that. It's time to get the glue out. It's, it's basically a standard wood glue. With guitars, we're not too worried about it being outside or anything like that. And uh, glue technology these days is so, so good that, uh, yeah, modern glues are rather amazing, really. Now, this is a nice tight joint. Once we're done here, this is going to be in place permanently. Once the glue has set, Ben starts on the guitar's final finish. First, the instrument is oiled. This is where the guitar absolutely comes to life. I, it's one of my favorite parts. This is going to be the finish, this is going to be the color. The oil penetrates right down into the, the wood itself and uh, protects it. Applying oil is not just cosmetic. Oils protect the wood and also help maintain the tone of the instrument. Once the oil has dried, the natural finishes preferred at crimson really start to shine. It's looking good, but it also has to sound good. It's time to sort the electrics. James Blackburn is Crimson's specialist with a soldering iron. It's delicate work, and he has to get it right. These, after all, are the key components of an electric guitar. I'm just going to wire up the tone with the capacitor. So I'm going to put the capacitor to one lug to ground. I'm then going to just wire up the two trolls and also the jack. Just outside the guitar, I've also done the most of the three-way switch uh, beforehand. Uh, and then I'll do it outside the guitar and then I'll put the pickups in and put all the electrics into the guitar. James has to be careful not to spill the solder. One drop of hot metal on the guitar and hours of work would be ruined in a second. He's got another problem. The guitar is left-handed. It's tricky. The controls and wiring are all on the opposite side to right-handed models. He works fast. One wrong move with the pliers and he has to start all over again. Another master guitar builder at Crimson is Christopher Owen. He often gets the tough jobs. Making this fretboard took all his skill. It's a very unusual design because the frets look completely wrong. Surely they should all be straight. But this is known as a compensated fretboard. The distance from fret to bridge has been calculated to make each note pitch perfect. This is one of the most challenging instruments I've had to build here at Crimson. Um, not so much because of the body or the neck construction or anything, but the fingerboard is where it's really quite unique. Um, this is a compensated fretboard. Every single fret position is compensated precisely to be the perfect intonation for every single note along the board. Um, there are still a few slight discrepancies, but much less than you'd find on a traditional straight fretted instrument. The reason this is a compensated fretboard is because the key measurement in determining your pitch is the distance from your fretted note to your bridge. This obviously changes every single position on the fretboard to make it exactly in line with what it needs to be. The reason for the first fret being quite so out of shape, uh, you have both the length of the string to deal with and also you have an increased pressure when you're pressing down on the string from the height of the nut, that changes the pitch of the string a little more than if you press that same string down here at the 12th fret. So yeah, you have a little more compensation up here than you would down at that very end. For many guitarists, one neck is just not enough. As far back as the 1930s, electric guitar makers produced instruments with more than one neck. 
A favorite combination was a standard six string paired with a mandolin. One of the most skilled parts of the whole production process at Marshall is the covering department. This is all done by hand. The wooden cabinets are covered in leather vinyl using only a few simple tools. It might look easy, but it's highly skilled and takes years of experience. Even the company's founder, Jim Marshall himself, used to do his bit in the covering department, even into his 60s. The amp being covered here is a rather special one. This is the amp we're going to use to test the crimson guitar. With the cabinet complete, it's time to start assembling the speaker with the electrics and controls. With everything assembled inside, the last panels are screwed onto the back of the amp. Marshall amps are precision made. Their international reputation depends on it. On some of their premium brand models, the wiring is done by hand. This can take up to six hours to complete. But no matter what the model or the process, they really take their time to make sure every amp is finished properly and is correctly tested. It's, it's a quick test, really. It's just a matter of safety testing it, which is on that little box there called a clear. Obviously, we have to make sure it's electrically safe, so we do that first. Turn it on, and it's just a matter of going over all the functions, again, just on, on one string on the guitar, just testing that all the functions actually work the way they should do. You can't actually teach somebody the sounds. That only comes from experience. So it's just a matter of doing the units over and over again. You, you get to know what, what the units sound like, what the functions should, should sound like. Back at Crimson, Ben is finishing the guitar himself. Time is not on his side. He only has a few hours to assemble the metalwork. First comes the bridge. This anchors the strings. At the other end, he has to fit the machine heads. These are used to tune the strings. We are about to find out very soon if this guitar hits the right note. The finale. Our guitar is moments from completion. First, the strings. There are final adjustments to the pickups. A screw for the neck strap. The logo, of course. And one left-handed guitar is ready to go. I like it. It is, it's working. Um, I am obviously playing it backwards and upside down to what I would normally play, but um, it feels comfortable. The strings are, are correct. The electronics are working fine. It's a brand new guitar. The strings are going to stretch. The wood is going to move a little bit. And uh, we'll see how the demo goes uh, over at Marshall. But uh, I am absolutely happy with how this is turning out. And uh, yeah, can't wait to see the result. <laughs> Finally, our guitar is ready. All done in just three days. The big question, what is it going to sound like? Over to Chris George at Marshall. It's a bit like Christmas, this feeling. Wow, look at that. There's something about uh, a 
unboxed in a new guitar that's, that gives you that childhood feeling of Christmas, you know what I mean? That kind of, wow, what's going to be inside it? And that is a, that's a really nice bit of kit. And, and you know, one of those things where, um, look, you know, looking at things like the inlays here, look at that. As with anything that's of high quality, you're looking at things like attention to detail and how they're built and time that's taken and, and the man hours and the blood, sweat and tears that has gone into something like this, which I think probably a lot of us take for granted when you go into a music shop and you see you know, hundreds of guitars lined up on the wall, you've no idea the craft and skill and, and design that's gone into something, whether that be a guitar or, a, or an amplifier. Considering this was built in you know, two or three days, it's just incredible, really, that how something can start as a bit of wood and, and end up like this. And there's the things that you, you don't see on a guitar as well inside. You know, electronics, the wiring, the you know the truss rod that will be running through here to make sure that the, the neck is straight. So, yeah, really impressed. Let's put it through its paces. That'd be great. As a top-flight session guitarist, Chris knows a good instrument when he sees one. All the efforts of the team at Marshall and the team at Crimson Guitar are about to be tested. So this is really where it comes together, the, the marriage of the guitar and the amplifier working together. Uh, you know, the guitar is far from being a bit of wood with some strings on. The amplifier is far from being a box with a speaker in. There's so much more to both of these things, which give them the soul and the character. Uh, and ultimately, bringing them together gives you this, this kind of thing, you know. rock and roll, there's nothing quite like it. I think it's time for me to start practicing. Join me again soon. <laughs> <laughs>